Hello, and welcome to the next episode of the Epri Current. My name is Samantha Gilman, and I am your host today as we talk about energy storage and the road to COP28. We have two Epri experts with us today. First, Andrew Maxson is the Senior Program Manager at EPRI for our Bulk Energy Storage Program. And then we have Zaid Alansari, who is the Senior Regional Manager for the Mideast, managing all of our activities in the region. So first off, Andrew, tell us a little bit about what you do at EPRI. Thanks, Samantha. It's great to be here this morning. I'm a Senior Program Manager here at EPRI, and I lead a program that focuses on uh, energy storage. And I also dabble in the low carbon resources initiative, which is focusing on hydrogen and other low carbon fuels. I've been around for 15 years. I've done a lot in my EPRI career, but I'm really excited about being involved in energy storage. It's such an important topic and one that is having such a large impact on the on the power and energy, energy industries um, as the grid is going through this massive change to be able to be low carbon in the future. Great. Zaid, tell us a little bit about your role at EPRI. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, you know, so as you said, my name is Zaid al Ansari, and I'm based out of our Dubai office. Some of you don't know, but we actually have an EPRI office here in Dubai. It's probably one of our best, but that's my uh, opinion. And, uh, and I manage EPRI's activities throughout the Middle East region. Uh, so that includes our nuclear customers, as well as our PDU and our generation. And it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, a lot of the uh, activities we're doing here in the Middle East region have been boosted the last few years because of the energy transition and the region's commitment towards energy transition. And EPRI has a really a vital role, a critical role to play in guiding those utilities towards those goals of decarbonization by 2050 or increasing their share of renewable energy penetration in the next few years. So uh, really a lot of aggressive targets, and I'm really happy to see EPRI play, playing such an important role uh, in that endeavor. Great. Well, let's get into the questions. First off for you, Andrew, can you give our listeners some context into the kinds of energy storage research EPRI is working on? Um, I just want to also give a shout out to the Palo Alto office. Uh, as Zaid gave a shout out to the Dubai office. We, we think we're the best, but I think all our EPRI offices are great. Charlotte is our largest campus. So hmm. <laughs> anyways, go ahead, Andrew. Energy storage is an enabler. Um, you simply cannot achieve a low carbon future without energy storage. Energy storage allows the growth of, of wind and solar, which are intermittent. So the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. And energy storage is a way to, to store wind and solar when you have an excess amount so you can use it when you need it. So that the proverbial phrase is when you flip a light switch, the lights always come on. You want to have a reliable grid that we've had for, for decades, largely because of thermal power in the form of fossil always being available. Energy storage is, is designed to fulfill that role that, that thermal power did in the past. So it, its goal is to allow us to move towards a low carbon future and provide a reliable uh, grid that will work as, as we're used to over the last uh, 100 years in, in the world. So you mentioned how energy storage is going to play a key role in the clean energy transition. As you mentioned, uh, some of the renewables coming online, wind, solar are intermittent, and there needs to be a place to store this energy when it's being created and so be used when it's needed. Could you tell us a bit about the difference about through the short term energy storage like a lithium ion battery and the long term, some of those technologies that you just mentioned? Yeah, EPRI is really focused on all types and issues associated with, with energy storage because it's such an important uh, topic and, and area. Um, different regions and different use cases uh, throughout the world will, will likely require multiple types of energy storage with, with different characteristics. So EPRI is researching pumped hydro, which is the most common by a wide margin type of, of energy storage globally, as well as lithium ion batteries, which are the, the, the type of energy storage, which is growing the fastest throughout the world. But, but on top of that, uh, we're working on other newer, less mature types of energy storage that have a chance to be 
lower cost and to fit some of the use cases that pumped hydro and lithium ion might not be able to handle. One of those is uh, thermal energy storage um, that store electricity as heat, generally in a, in a media like a concrete or a sand or, or gravel. And then that heat can be used at a, a later time to, to generate um, electricity. We're also looking at mechanical types that store kinetic or potential energy, which again can be used at a later time to create cr great power when needed. And chemical energy, which is um, using a, a low carbon fuel that typically needs to be created uh, through electricity um, to be able to produce power. And hydrogen is, is at the forefront of that and the focus of a lot of our research, along with a couple of other principal ones like ammonia and, and biofuels. As more wind and solar come online and throughout the world, uh, each region is in different statuses of where they're at in terms of the penetration of, of wind and solar. Um, as you get more and more online, you, you're going to need longer durations of energy storage. So when you go out to longer durations, um, it's, it needs to be cheap um, and it needs to potentially be large. So th this is fostering the growth of different types of energy storage, which are, are thought that they're going to be cheaper as you get bigger and, and, and longer duration. For shorter durations, um, a lot of the technologies are already mature. Lithium ion batteries are prevalent in the one to four hour market, which is the, the most prevalent market right now for, for energy storage. Um, and you'll see that throughout the US and in Europe where um, it's usually to, to help with um, solar applications where you only need a shorter period of, of energy storage. But that requirement will grow as more and more wind and, and solar come online. And that's where some of these other types of energy storage that I talked about, thermal, mechanical, and chemical, will likely be needed to create an overall portfolio that, that fits all of the use cases and circumstances that um, an energy storage or a, a power producer will need to provide. Thanks, Andrew. Zaid, I want to talk to you a bit about our activities over in the Mideast. Recently, EPRI and GCIAA recently hosted the Energy Storage Forum in Dubai. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that event and the collaboration with that organization? Absolutely, yeah. It was a really significant event. It attracted utilities from across the Middle East region, including the North Africa region. Um, and it was a platform where a lot of our experts were able to showcase uh, best practices around the energy transition, specifically how energy storage can play an important part in that discussion um, from across the world. And that was a unique thing that Apple was able to bring into that uh, forum. It was, it was our ability to kind of connect the collaboration and kind of focus the discussion into a forum like the energy storage uh, event that happened in Dubai, uh, you know, just kind of showed the unique value that Apri can bring into, into the discourse that happens across uh, regions like the Middle East or across, uh, some else, uh, other places in the world. Um, the forum, uh, uh, you know, was opened by uh, our uh, CEO and President, Dr. Arshad, and he shared, uh, you know, some really comprehensive insights into the capabilities of energy storage technology. Uh, and his discussion also extended beyond uh, the standard, you know, lithium ion batteries and, uh, you know, he really shed light onto the whole long duration energy storage technology aspect and how that can play an important role in the integration of renewable energy and other variable energy resources. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that Arshad kind of struck a note with the whole audience was how the duck curve that we keep talking about for the last several years is coming quickly into a canyon curve. We're already seeing that in California where you lose 10 gigawatts uh, across the morning and the, the Kaizo and the utilities there have to figure out how to manage that drop in, in, um, in, in load. And so the technology and the best practices are being developed there and what needs to happen in the Middle East across the whole world. You know, Arshad kind of brought all of that into light and really, you know, what the, the need for increasing flexibility in the power sector and the importance of diverse resources and uh, practices like having a 
more uh, reliable interconnector between the different countries in the region. And again, the same can apply in other regions as well, allows for that, uh, for a successful energy transition. And even when beyond that, you know, time of use rates and, you know, the various long duration energy storage I mentioned earlier, technologies are currently being developed and being showcased across the world into viable commercial solutions. Uh, you know, they really they really were coming, coming to light and being brought into a discussion uh, with various leaders that attended that event. And so it really added value uh, into how, how EPRI can help uh, the region in this energy transition. And I, I looked at some of, I watched some of Arshad's remarks from the event. And one of the things that he sort of tasked the audience with is um, at the same event next year, as this is now an annual event, um, to come to the event with actionable things that we can do. Like let, no more talking and hypotheticals and, you know, in the future, it's what can we start taking action now? What can we do to get these technologies deployed and um, progressed? I don't know if there's anything you want to say to that. No, absolutely. I think that's a, a brilliant point you brought up. You know, Ashad was really focused on the on the tangible, uh, uh, let's say, takeaways we can have from this event. He he challenged the audience with selecting the top ten technologies that we can start piloting in the region. And our relationship with the GCCIA, uh, which is very fruitful, and we're very proud of it because they really do connect us with the, all of the main utilities in the region. Uh, you know, we we have a roadmap together that we're going to be we're currently executing on that allows us to look at technologies, how they're being piloted, how they are being assessed in their applicability and their uh, suitability for their, for the for a region with, with interesting, let's say, unique environment like the Middle East and how those technologies can fit in here, you know, successfully. Piloting those technologies, demonstrating their success and making sure that the innovation is behind that effort is going to allow for a successful integration and adoption of those technologies. And Ashad really kind of challenged the whole audience which included utility leaders, utility technical managers, and how to kind of come back uh, with ideas and plans of how to uh, uh, demonstrate and uh, pilot those technologies so that we could see them very soon on the on the grid network uh, being uh, being used. So COP28 coming up later this year in November is going to take place in Dubai as well. How did this event sort of lay the groundwork for the path to COP28? So the whole COP28 is about the energy transition and the fact that this event really set a platform for a technical discussion around what we need to do today. So our ability to walk into COP is more informed, right? So our approach to COP becomes more informed in what we need to do. So those tangible actions that we need to work on now become points of discussion in terms of outcome during the COP28, or at least in terms of planning and strategy in COP28. So it really set us up well. It put us on the map in terms of what EPRI does in light in, in anticipation of the COP28 event. And, and keep in mind, the COP28 event is only a short drive from where the energy storage event has happened, right? So a lot of the leaders that we met in the energy storage forum will be at COP28, and they're all familiar with what EPRI has, let's say, uh, promoted in terms of energy, energy storage discussion, energy transition discussion. And so really the COP28 will be a continuation of that discussion that we had during the energy storage forum. Again, it puts us in the map in terms of what we're looking to focus on and what we should be focusing on uh, during the COP28 event. Arshad, as a result of that uh, energy storage forum, uh, basically met with the leaders and we're looking at hosting those leaders along with other uh, utility leaders from around from international regions into a sort of a roundtable event during COP28 that will build on what we had uh, discussed during the energy storage forum and really look at the wider picture, what the energy 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 transition looks like, the challenges associated with that energy transition, but also the technology needed to make that energy transition successful. And a note to our listeners, uh, make sure you stay tuned to future episodes of the EPRI Current as we will be doing more around COP28 and EPRI's role and what the discussions there are. So Andrew, Zaid, thank you so much for joining me today. I want to give you an opportunity to leave any final thoughts with our listeners. Uh, so Zaid, what final thoughts do you have? I'll just say, you know, with the COP28 coming up, 
Try to leverage that event as a way to reconfirm your uh, relationship with your existing utilities, strengthen them, and then hopefully we'll use COP28 as a platform to further elevate EPRI's position in the global power sector. And if you want to access the takeaways, the recording of the energy storage event, which has a lot of interesting discussion points, as well as uh, informative uh, uh, presentations, uh, there's a link that will be posted uh, that you could uh, visit and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the recording as well as the presentation material as much as we have. That's right. And you can actually learn more about COP28 at epri.com backslash COP28. Um, and so, Andrew, what are your final thoughts? This is important. It's really important because power is is really the great enabler for um, a healthy society and making it stable so that we don't have blackouts, that we have reliable power is critical for the world. So this is a really, really important topic. And I, I personally think that EPRI has um, a sizable role to play in this because we have the technical expertise, yes, and, and we do have a considerable number of resources focusing on energy storage, but we're unbiased, we're independent. Now, we don't have a dog in the hunt, as they say. So that means that when we work on a project, we can provide both the industry and the developers um, unbiased results um, that is more credible and, and more believable. And that's what everyone really needs right now. They need accurate and believable information so that they can make the right decisions in an industry that's going through changes that it's never had to go through at, in this rapid amount of time. That's great. Well, that's it for today's episode of the EPRI Current. Again, I'm your host, Samantha Gilman, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks. If you like today's show, we invite you to subscribe to our podcast and feel free to share the podcast with your colleagues and friends. For more information about EPRI, please visit our website at www.epri.com. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter at EPRI News. Together, we are shaping the future of energy.